Welcome back to Tabletop Legends. Today we're putting down our d20s and grabbing a fistful of d10s to delve into the world of darkness. This next adventure is from a game of Hunter the Vigil. If you don't know what that is, it is a modern day occult game where monsters of urban myth like vampires and werewolves lurk in the shadows of our cities, preying on the unsuspecting masses. Humanity's last resort are hunters. Men and women who put their lives and their sanity on the line to fight back against supernatural predators. This game featured a whopping nine players and ran for a little over a year long. Our story takes place in the fictional city of Neontropolis, Florida, a sprawling urban jungle with an alarmingly high tendency to attract monsters of all sorts. Every major global conspiracy has converged here to draft up representatives of each organization to form an experimental pillar cell, combining the strengths of every faction to handle any situation. Today's story follows Beverly Simon, political tabloid blogger, paranormal investigator, and expert hacker able to seize any communication network and crack into any database. Her specialty is information warfare, and she makes up for her lack of combat ability by providing her team with surveillance and reconnaissance to gain a tactical advantage in any situation. She represents Network Zero, the Secret Frequency, a guerrilla group of journos and truth seekers who weaponize information technology to expose monsters to the world. Her fellow hunters are Cliff Hawk, a burly woodsman with a frightening ability to jury-rig any assortment of items into death-dealing contraptions. Sasquatches ate his mama. He represents the Union, the Torch and Pitchfork mob, regular Dicks and Janes who are tired of becoming collateral. Patrick Lance, a seven-foot-tall man with a vacant stare and deadly skills with a blade. He hides his past trauma with a plastic smile and an unfettered enthusiasm for killing. He represents Task Force Valkyrie, Soldiers and engineers who formed the government's secret branch of paranormal homeland defense, who armed themselves with top secret weapons and gadgets. Isaias Eo, Izzy for short, a tortured soul who has long since embraced the literal demons in his blood. He wants nothing more than to retire from the vigil and pursue a career as a concert pianist. He represents the Lucifuge, the actual children of the devil, whose tainted blood allows them to manifest infernal castigations. Simon Mole prefers to be called Small, a short-statured hunter whose disturbing fascination with knives is matched only by his absolute hatred of occult magic. He represents Division Six, a rogue group of witch hunters who splintered off from the government, or so they claim. Victor Frank, trauma surgeon and medical engineer. When he's not stitching hunters back together from lethal werewolf bites, he's picking apart monster corpses to extract their secrets. He represents the Chiron Group, a global conglomerate of shareholders and mad scientists who hunt monsters not just for profit, but to exploit monster supernatural anatomies to develop bizarre Thama technology. Boris Klasky, a veteran hunter whose scarred mind has hit him with a double whammy of short-term and long-term amnesia. Boris might not even be his real name. Despite his forgetfulness, he's a high-ranking member of the Aegis Kaidoru an ancient order that dates back to mythic Greece. While Boris is more than capable with a gun in his hands, he also wields the Aegis's armory of ancient relics with strange powers. Addison Loy, a street racer with a thrill for danger, a skilled sniper, but she's far more deadly behind the wheel of her beloved Ferrari 488 GTB. She represents the Night Watch, a crude coalition of urban protectors who patrol the back streets for alleyway predators. She's never seen without her partner, Rodney. Flan Casero, fashion blogger and low-effort clickbait poster. The vigil is more like a party to her, one where she gets to fuck monsters. I'm not kidding, her sheet has a specialty called Monster Fucker. She represents Ashwood Abbey, a rich kid's club of sociopathic degenerates who hunt to satiate their depraved cravings. The Pillar Cell is dispatched to its first few missions and are quickly discovered to be lethal, destructive, and unpredictable. They are first tasked to investigate unnatural anomalies, bizarre weather patterns and mutilated remains of vermin, localized around an old antique shop downtown. The investigation reveals a hidden cabal of occultists, and the hunt quickly goes sour when Izzy first reveals his demonic powers and is suddenly turned on by both Patrick and Cliff, 
who willfully and brutally maim and cripple him to near death. Once Beverly intervenes to call a ceasefire, they learn from the mages about some unknown cosmic entity that's been causing these anomalies, and are warned to keep out of their business. Small trespasses to the back room and discovers the mages' research. Human bodies, not quite living, not quite dead, whose flesh deforms and undulates in a grotesque, unnatural fashion, sinews tearing apart and weaving themselves back in a macabre cycle. The mages do not take this intrusion lightly, and the cell is banished from the sanctum forever. Their next few missions place them in pursuit of two suspect individuals, Gulag, an amiable and innocent hulking brute of a man, and Valentine, a lithe and beautiful man who is confident and calculating. In truth, they are Prometheans, artificial humans who lack a soul, whose very uncanny presence causes unease and disquiet to those around them. They are first encountered in a nightclub, which soon erupts into a violent encounter where Gulag demonstrates terrifying monstrous strength, requiring Izzy to unveil his true demonic form to even hope to match the enraged Titan. Boris joins the cell shortly after, bringing his veteran expertise and bizarre relics into the fold. Their second encounter would be at an underground fighting ring, where they also meet Foley, a man who maintains immortality by bathing in human blood. Once the liaison for the two Prometheans, he intended to cut ties with them by tipping off the cell to their location. As the hunters gave chase, Gulag and Valentine fled underground, where they are unexpectedly waylaid by a bizarre, malformed creature of twisted flesh and gnashing teeth. Critically injured and cornered by hunters, Valentine surrenders himself to their custody in exchange for Gulag's freedom. The hunters agree, and Valentine is placed under watch by the Chiron group, whose labs will contain and examine him. Beverly, meanwhile, attempts to make contact with Foley. At first, he responds with hostility, but she manages to talk him down. They agree for the moment to stay out of each other's business. It was the fourth mission in which the Pillar Cell met their first real crisis. Addison is assigned to the cell, bringing her Streetwise and her prized racing machine with her. Mysterious sightings of mutilated animals near Cliff's forest cabin spur the Pillar Cell into an investigation. There they discover animals reanimated by strange glowing spheres embedded into their bodies, as well as an unexpected run-in with Foley, and a giant wolf made of shadow and darkness that appears to follow him. But before the case could be drawn to a close, a mysterious entity makes itself known. It is shaped like a man, made entirely of the stuff of space and cosmos, save for a carved wooden mask with circular holes to reveal two bright spheres of starlight where its eyes should be. It calls itself Birth, destroyer of death. It speaks in a calm voice, confessing that the spheres and the animals were its work. Before the cell can act, he raises a hand, and Foley begins to convulse. His flesh starts to warp and distort in a state of suspended death, like the bodies found at the back of the mage's sanctum. The alien being calling itself Birth then releases more glowing spheres, each coalescing with cosmic darkness and starlight until they begin taking the shape of familiar bodies, rising as faceless doppelgangers of each of the hunters themselves. Out here on a stranded highway in the woods, far from the city and facing an unknown alien threat, Beverly felt helpless for the first time. No computers, no surveillance, no cell phone reception, and even her camera equipment began to fail within the thing's presence. She could only run and hide as the doppelgangers sprang into action, each of them as violent and deadly as their counterpart. Dr. Victor, meanwhile, attended to Foley with feverish determination. Through a mixture of surgical mastery, unbroken focus, and the haste of urgency, Victor performs the impossible and halts the effect of Birth's strange curse, overturning the judgment of a god with the hands and tools of man. His success is short-lived, for he is soon beset upon by the doppelganger of Izzy, who also possesses Izzy's true bestial form, and collapses upon the Doctor with pure killing intent. The doppelgangers proved a deadly match for the Hunters in every way, but the Hunters still had one thing the doppelgangers did not. Addison's Ferrari 488 GTB. She slams the pedal and dispatches most of the doppelgangers in a single decisive drift. The rest of the doppelgangers are swiftly eliminated, but not before discovering that destroying their glowing core causes a lethal eruption of energy that nearly wipes out the cell. The battle draws to a close, but Victor remains in critical condition. With no other doctors nearby, Foley steps forward and administers first aid, 
According to a background check Beverly made on him prior to this, she discovered that the man who calls himself Foley once served in World War II as a battlefield medic, and is more than capable of saving Victor's life. With both the Hunters and Foley surviving the encounter with the alien anomaly, Beverly takes a moment to re-establish the party's relations with Foley, gaining him as an additional point of contact should any other cases like this arise. The threat was now clear. The being called Birth was the cosmic entity that the mages had warned about. It became the Cell's job to find out what Birth is, what it wants, and how to kill it. Flan Cassero joins the Cell at this point, adding to the group's collective bloodlust. As new missions come in, each hunter works to strengthen themselves. Cliff develops more insane backwoods contraptions. Boris picks through the Aegis Kaidoru's vault for more strange relics. Izzy pours through the Lucifuge's archives to unlock more secrets of castigation. Addison earns some cash in street races to purchase specialty contraband items. Patrick frequents the Fight Club to refine his fighting technique. Beverly, however, use her time to increase her status and influence within the organization, expanding her information network and gaining access to archives and secrets even from groups outside Network Zero. After her experience in the woods, Beverly also knew that she could no longer afford to remain defenseless. Using her contacts from Network Zero and Task Force Valkyrie, and with Cliff's unconventional engineering assistance, Beverly fabricates a portable drone with a camera, mounted submachine gun, and assisted targeting software, effectively allowing her to fight remotely using her computer skill. One evening, Beverly decides to take the night off, leaving the rest of the pillar cell to operate without her supervision. They have the location of two Prometheans hiding inside an apartment complex. Without Beverly to provide surveillance or tactics, they decide to set the whole building on fire to smoke them out. Beverly is suddenly called to the office to catch the tail end of these antics, far too late to make any meaningful reparations. She resolved to never let the group to their own devices ever again. As the Cell pursues more cases, Beverly takes every opportunity to expand her contacts network, recruiting allies with supernaturals and gaining access to occult knowledge and tools. One such resource that became invaluable to the hunt was access to the Mage's Market, an interdimensional space where all supernaturals converge in a ceasefire zone to trade wares and information. There, Beverly learned the existence of Arcadia, the realm of Fae. Birth possessed something called a title, a metaphysical property belonging to powerful Archfey called the Gentry. Birth obtained one himself, imbuing him with otherworldly Fey powers. His goal, quite simply, was to eradicate the metaphysical concept of death from the world. He plans to do that by means of an ancient ritual spell. The being known as Birth was also gifted with the mage's magic. Arcadia, after all, is one of five domains from which mages draw their power. To complete this spell, Birth required a list of esoteric reagents. Treated Plasm of a Ghost Walker, Divine Fire of Prometheus's Progeny, Awakened Brains worth a thousand years of knowledge, and a pickled vampire heart. If they could keep those out of his hands, they could thwart the ritual definitively. Steadily, the pillar cell was drawing closer to a conclusive victory, but elsewhere, more sinister designs began to take shape. During an early operation, Small is shot at point-blank by a shotgun, lethally wounding him to near death. He is evacuated immediately to the van to be operated on by Victor for critical surgery. While in a coma, Small hears a faint voice in his head, a gentle voice, promising power to grant what he desires. Floating on the edge of death, Small is overcome by a single impulse. His undying hatred for occultists and mages. Willingly, he accepts the voice's gift of power, and during his surgery, Victor sees one of Birth's spheres of light manifest inside Small's body. Undeterred, Victor continues operating, confident that he can best the celestial being a second time. The sphere refuses to be extracted, and without regarding Small's health or well-being, Victor continues prodding and pulling at it, even risking Small's death to satiate his curiosity. Small is eventually stitched back together. With the sphere embedded within him, Small develops a preternatural ability to detect the presence of magic, like a radar in his brain. Driven by hatred, he spends part of his downtime between missions simply wandering the city, following his instincts to find and kill mages at his leisure. But the whispers did not stop. In his dreams, he drifted back into that sinking void, and the voice continued to tempt him. It asked for favors, 
small and incidental at first, but then it began asking Small to turn on his fellow hunters. Unquestioningly, he agreed. To engorge his bloodlust for mages, he stole small samples of each hunter, scraps of cloth, pieces of hair, a drop of blood if possible. He never asked why. He even knew he was working for the enemy, but he didn't care. All he wanted was to kill every mage he could find. Dr. Victor, meanwhile, became occupied with other obsessions. His time studying the artificial human Valentine has led him to several surgical breakthroughs, and even the discovery that he is the progeny of the real Victor Frankenstein. He takes a trip to Germany to explore the abandoned remains of the Frankenstein estate, discovering the ruins of Frankenstein's lab, and finding the mad scientist's old notes. He began to learn the secrets of the Prometheans and of the power of Azoth that gives them artificial life. Knowing that he had already once bested a god, and learning of his lineage, Victor's obsession turned him toward a spiral of megalomania. It wasn't enough to recreate Frankenstein's work. He had to succeed where his progenitor failed. The Pillar Cells soon found themselves occupied with dangerous weather patterns centralized on the forests. Overnight, the region became overcast with thunderclouds. Highways were closed due to roadside lightning strikes, as an ill-boding storm began to brew. Gulag and the other Prometheans hiding in the woods rallied together to greet their father, the original Frankenstein's monster. He knew that hunters were preying on his kin, and his only recourse was to destroy the city of Neontropolis entirely, in a storm of lightning and fury. Beverly saw the opportunity to make a powerful ally, but just as ever, she could scarcely keep her own team under control. As the monster made himself known, Cliff looked upon his visage, a colossal beast of savage might dressed only in animal furs. At last, Cliff's fated enemy, the Sasquatch, appeared before him. An explosion tears through the woods as Cliff lets loose his hand grenades, fatally wounding most of the party in the blast while barely putting a dent in the monster. Cliff did not care. The monster's retaliation was swift, having decimated the other half of the party with a tree torn from its roots. With most of the party out of commission, whether by grenade or tree bludgeon, Beverly was desperate to call a ceasefire. The monster, likely knowing how easily it could destroy them, obliged. Beverly warned the monster that his clan was in danger, not because of hunters, but because Birth was hunting them to obtain their divine fire. But before any decision could be drawn, both the Cell and the Prometheans come under attack by grotesque, uncanny humanoid creatures remains of Victor's failed experiments that he's released into the woods. The hunters emerge wounded, but triumphant. By protecting the forest Prometheans, they've gained the monster's trust. As the Cell continues to strengthen and arm themselves against the impending cosmic threat, Beverly continues to grow her influence within Network Zero, eventually securing a high-ranking seat as chief editor. Her mobile attack drone, unofficially called Deathcopter by literally everyone, proves to be a success after extensive field testing. Beverly commissions more to be built, and begins recruiting for a team of Deathcopter pilots. They will require precision, exceptional hand-eye coordination, fast reflexes, good team communication, and fast decision-making skills. In other words, competitive gamers. She scours the internet for top-ranking FPS players, and those who pass Network Zero screening are then given basic operations training and tested as pilot candidates. Beverly assembles a team of four to serve as her first Deathcopter unit, her own personal fast response remote fire squad, deployable from anywhere. She assigns lower ranked Net Zero hunters to serve as field scouts, keeping an eye out for anything regarding Birth or his targets, and instructed to flee at the first sign of engagement. It's through this expansive information web that Beverly is first informed that one of the gentry has arrived to seek her out in person. She calls herself Madame of the Clouds, and she came to the Pillar Cell with a warning. Birth has not only been on the move to collect the components for his ritual, but he has also been consuming the titles of other gentry. She also revealed the nature of his existence. The true body of Birth exists in the realm of Arcadia, and each instance of Birth the Cell has encountered was the shadow of a consumed gentry. In order to destroy Birth definitively, the Cell must travel to Arcadia, but it is not that simple. To do so, they will need a title of their own, or someone possessing one. The Madame herself is in hiding, and her powers outside Arcadia are waning, so she is unable to help. Instead, they track down another Promethean who possesses the title of Cracked Light. 
She proves to be stronger than the average Promethean, and in the process of capturing her, Izzy loses his left arm. However, with the use of a strange device, Victor manages to manually extract the fragment of cracked light from within the Promethean, isolating it from its host. As Victor takes the fragment back to his lab, the rest of the cell continues hunting for more titles. Beverly eventually learns that to locate birth, they require the assistance of three other titles. The titles of Reverberance, Consumption, and Death Itself. In the process of locating Reverberance and enlisting its help, more bad news emerges. Reports have come in of bodies of known cultists and mages from one town over, found dead with their brains missing. The cell is unaware that this is Small's handiwork, as the knife murderer remains silent on the matter. It is a race against time as the cell must work to prevent Birth from completing his ritual, as well as to find a way to travel his domain and kill him definitively. But another complication soon arises. An order comes to the cell from the top brass at Chiron group. Find and kill Dr. Victor Frank. Victor has remained absent ever since he was left alone with the extracted sample of cracked light. Beverly and Boris use their top-level clearance to strong-arm their way into Victor's lab. His secretary insists that the doctor is off on vacation to Germany, but the pair find no such plane ticket in the doctor's office. A more thorough search reveals notes of his discoveries in Germany, as well as records of his breakthroughs in experiments with Prometheans and Azoth. Knowing that Victor was responsible for the monster attacks in the forest, it became clear to the cell that Victor was now a liability and needed to be stopped. As Beverly attempts to make a thorough investigation through Victor's desk, Boris has a premonition of imminent danger. He shuffles through his pockets for an especially rare relic. A diamond that distorts and twists a fragment of time preventing Beverly from ever having touched the desk in the first place. The desk, as it turns out, was a trap. A mimic in the shape of a desk, waiting to consume whomever had come to search through it, and another product of Victor's experiments with created life. Knowing that Victor had anticipated their trespassing and having narrowly dodged a deadly death trap, Beverly and Boris take their findings and leave. Quote the GM, I was so ready for y'all to fight that desk. With Victor missing from Chiron's facilities and nowhere to be found, there remained only one conclusion. Victor consumed the title of a cracked light and fled to Arcadia. With no more time to waste, the cell prepared themselves for a trip between dimensions. They make one last stop to the mage market to commission specialty weapons and countermeasures. Blades and bullets, cold forged from cold iron. The Fey's natural weakness. However, in their haste, the cell realized too late that they were being followed. Another shadow of birth manifests inside the mage market, this time a towering giant of swirling darkness and twilight, laying waste to everything in sight. The hunters immediately strike back, but the shadow of birth unleashes a paralyzing illusion, tempting to imprison Beverly in her own mind with visions of her own death. Beverly manages to overcome this mental prison with the raw determination that only a human could muster. The rest of the team's focused weaponry manages to destroy the apparition, and though the danger is gone, the mage's market chooses to seal away all its entrances for the time being. With the assistance of the title of Reverberance, the cell steps through the rift between realms and emerges in Arcadia. The hunters have two daunting objectives. Locate and enlist the help of the titles of Consumption and Death, and locate and destroy Victor. Traveling the alien geography distorts the group's sense of distance and time, but through searing hellscapes and cold voids they find their marks and convince them to help. Eventually, they arrive in a bizarre, sterile metropolis. Towering buildings and monuments, but no people within. Like an empty facsimile of a city. This was no doubt Victor's abode. The central building is the only building staffed by people, or at least a receptionist. No doubt, also Victor's creation. The cell is also escorted to the top floor where they meet with Victor, who greets them amiably. The doctor maintains a pretense of conversation to explain his discoveries with a narrow hope that the party would find his philosophy agreeable. He hasn't even stopped opposing birth, and he believes that his success in creating life has elevated him beyond his astral nemesis. But no one believed, for one second, that this pretense of peace would last. It was soon time for the hunters to conduct a business. Victor showcases extraordinary battle abilities, far beyond what he was capable of as a frail human doctor. But the fight takes a turn when Cliff unleashes one of his specialty weapons, the Birth Herder. Originally designed to destroy Birth itself, Cliff brandishes a bullwhip with ten grenades pinned to it, 
with its combined explosive payload swiftly exterminating the Doctor once and for all. When the Cell returns from Arcadia, they find that the time distortion between the Fey Realm is inconsistent with the passage of time in the real world. The days they spent traveling Arcadia translated to weeks in the real world, in which time more trouble has emerged. In their absence, Berth has managed to perfect his doppelgangers, using the DNA samples that Small stole for him, allowing them to infiltrate the Hunter Organization's headquarters and attempt assassinations on each of their leaders. Another byproduct of Small's betrayal. Beverly scours through her information network for signs of these doppelgangers. She finds that most of them have taken on new names, identities, and lifestyles. Some aren't even aware that they are doppelgangers and are living quiet lives to themselves until they encounter their marks and become killers. The perfect sleeper agents. Doppelganger Patrick was a martial arts instructor. Doppelganger Small was a sushi chef. Doppelganger Flan worked in a clothing store. Scarcely a problem for a team of immoral psychopaths, as they systematically track down, kidnap, and murder each one. Except for Doppelganger Cliff, who is every bit as paranoid and dangerously armed as his counterpart. The situation soon escalates as another wave of Doppelgangers arrives, this time actively hunting the Pillar Cell themselves. These hybrid Doppelgangers combine the traits of each of the Hunters, an assassin with small sneaking skills and Addison sniping a juggernaut with Pat's brawn and Izzy's castigations, a one-man army with Boris's battlefield experience and Cliff's ingenuity, a spy with Flan's social manipulation and Beverly's hacking. The Pillar Cell continues to fight off these hybrid attackers until Beverly tracks down their origins. There seems to be a derelict house in the slums. Inside, they find the harrowing remains of a laboratory, macabre instruments, and glass vats full of half-formed flesh, waiting for the pulse of false life. The Hunters came prepared to face a monster in waiting, but soon discovered that the house itself was the monster. Floorboards and walls bent and twisted to form gnashing maws to swallow the Hunters alive. Luckily, Cliff had another makeshift weapon at his disposal. A rubber yoga ball, filled with hair gel and a hand grenade with its pin attached to a ripcord accessible from the outside. As the Hunters make their escape, Cliff tears off the pin, hurls the makeshift napalm, and says, Namaste. The grenade goes off, igniting the hair gel and setting the house monsters ablaze. With the house reduced to smoldering flesh and charred splinters, the threat of the doppelgangers was no more. There was no more time to waste. The pillar cell had to strike back immediately. With her organization influence already at peak, Beverly coordinates a joint operation between Network Zero, Task Force Valkyrie, and several of her supernatural contacts to form a splinter unit called Occult Specialists, Countermeasures, and Research, the Oscar Division. With Network Zero's information base, Task Force Valkyrie's resources, and actual mages in the lab, Oscar Division begins developing a weapon that can destroy Birth for good. Beverly is appointed as director of Oscar Division, and commissions a set of cold iron rings for the Pillar Cell to wear, to eliminate the possibility of future doppelgangers. Tracking down the remaining components for Birth's ritual, Beverly finds records of the pickled vampire heart exchanging hands, eventually being acquired by a Billy Parker. Further research reveals the history of a young mage whose life is replete with death, tragedy, and trauma at the hands of the Hunters, mages, and other humans. The Hunters prepare for what may be a one-way trip to Birth's domain. Oscar Division makes preparations for the Pillar Cell to bring their most powerful assets. A special large-sized ritual circle allows the Pillar Cell to bring several vehicles for equipment transport, as well as Addison's Ferrari. A handful of magic amulets that can provide some protection against mind control are handed to Izzy, Cliff, or Beverly to reduce the risk of friendly fire or shutting off team coordination. A Time Mage manages to create a stabilizing enchantment which syncs up a camera between the real world and Arcadia's time distortion, allowing Beverly's Death Copter Squad to deploy from headquarters into Arcadia without risk. With the aid of reverberance, consumption, and death, the Hunters delve into the deepest reaches of Arcadia. They arrive to a murky, cold place of pitch darkness, with only the lights of their vehicles revealing a maze of rickety wooden docks suspended over a deep, black lake. Strange, twisted men, with features of fish haphazardly blended into their forms, emerge to assail the Hunters as their collective gunfire awakens a larger predator from beneath the depths. Large, fleshy tendrils grasp at the docks, and the hunters fire back with high-yield explosives, 
A bloom of fire and gunpowder illuminates the darkness only long enough for the hunters to glimpse upon the giant of the lake. A writhing mass of snaking flesh, only barely taking a man's shape. The hunters immediately take their vehicles and flee toward solid ground, losing only two death coppers in their escape. Driving through the vast darkness, the group comes across a mansion. The interior appears derelict and abandoned, though its veneer as a house is quickly dismissed, as parts of the house appear to melt into a curdling, fleshy mass lining the walls, floors, and ceiling. More twisted abominations emerge from the shadows to attempt to ambush the party from all sides, and the party finds themselves split as they attempt to navigate the mansion's winding corridors. The hunters persevere and regroup, having escaped the twisted house into a vast expanse of endless stars, illuminated by a bright sun on the end of the horizon. From beyond, a voice calls out to them. Not the calming voice of the astral god Birth, but the shriveled, tear-stained voice of Billy Parker, who pleads woefully for the hunters to understand his pain. For Beverly, it's far past due for forgiveness, and the Pillar Cell has long since resolved to see this job through. The lights flicker out of the sky as the ground begins to swell. The party's true prey finally shows itself. Patrick activates a set of devices called Witchbusters, beacons that emit frequencies designed to disrupt the casting of magic, freeing the hunters to strike with everything they have. Cliff lets loose his second birth herder, exposing Parker long enough to deliver one decisive blow. Beverly reveals Oscar Division's secret weapon, a shard imbued with the concept of death, as she entrusts it to Small to finish the job. Plunging the shard into Parker's heart, the entire realm appears to fragment and collapse. The hunters return to the vehicles, hastily activate the return spell, and re-emerge in Oscar Division's facility. The job was finished, and the metaphysical fabric of reality remained intact. With the mission over, the Pillar Cell each choose to go their separate ways. Patrick, Small, and Cliff each go off the grid. Izzy and Flan, who have been dating, retire from hunter work to pursue Izzy's dream of being a pianist, with Flan's assistance for lacking his left arm. Boris finds a clue to his past and leaves to pursue it. Addison returns to the street racing circuit. As for Beverly, she remains as the director of Oscar Division, developing surveillance and countermeasure technology for observing and detaining supernatural threats. Should another case like Birth arise, she will reluctantly, but readily, call the Pillar Cell together back one more time. That's the end of Beverly Simon's tale. Thanks for listening, and leave a like and a comment if you enjoyed the story and you'd like to hear more of my tabletop adventures. Be sure to subscribe for more anime and game content from Sugar Punch. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank each and every one of our patrons for supporting us thus far. If you'd like to support us, check us out on Patreon for early access to our future videos. I'm ABI, and I'll see you on the next adventure.